The psalmist calls to worship with these words, I was glad when they said to me, Let us go into the house of the Lord. Our feet are standing within your gates, O Jerusalem. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they prosper who love you. Peace be within your walls and security within your towers. For the sake of my relative and friends, I will say, Peace be within you. Let us pray. Lord, from within these walls of this sacred place, we pray for your shalom to fill us and to draw us closer to our true home in you. Our hearts are restless until they find their rest in you, O Lord. So here, may the searching find direction, the lonely learn community, the anxious know your peace that passes all understanding. Come into our darkness, O Lord, with the light of Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Please remain seated as we sing the light of Christ into our worship this morning. As we wait upon the birth of our Lord, we take stock of our lives and we realize that on all of our journeys, we stumble and we fall. But if we confess our sins to God, God picks us up and cleanses us of all of our sin. So let us now confess our sins together using the prayer printed in our bulletins. God of promised peace, we come before you acknowledging that we are frantic in these days and shalom seems fleeting. The pace exhausts us and leads us to feel like exiles in a land increasingly alien. Forgive us for crowding Jesus out of our lives and for failing to sing his song in this foreign land. Deliver us from darkness and lead us to your light, revealed in Jesus Christ, who came to die for these and all our sins, which we confess now in silence. Amen. Take comfort and believe in the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are all forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. 
I ask you to remain seated as we sing hymn number nine, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. Grace and peace to you, and welcome to worship here at First Presbyterian Church in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. It is the second Sunday of Advent, and we welcome all who worship with us this day here or those who are worshiping with us by television broadcast throughout the state. We're honored. Many of our Auburn students are back after their exams, and, well, Alabama students still have that to look forward to. Uh, You may pray not only for the students, but also that their professors may not only know justice, but also mercy. Uh, It's a difficult time, but also next, this coming Saturday, is graduation for many, so it's an exciting time as well. The hopes and fears of all the years are met in thee tonight. Two doctoral students there getting their doctor, yes. Uh, But anyway, we are glad that you're here. Please let us know. Sign the attendance pads and pass those back and forth that we may know that you're here. Indicate if there are ways that we can assist you in your discipleship. And if you feel led to join this church, please speak to us. We'd love to tell you about the ways to commit your life to Christ here in this place and how we could use you for God's glory here. We will be honored indeed. There are a number of announcements you'll find in your bulletin that you want to pay careful attention to, and I'll underline some of them. In particular, that um, a week from today in the evening, we have a carols by candlelight. It'll be at six o'clock in here. We'll have the candles lit. Choir has been rehearsing and preparing this gift for you, and it will be ready for us to unwrap and to enjoy. We also then the next Wednesday have a longest night worship service. This is a difficult time for many in this, their journey of faith and 
we pause on that Wednesday night at 615 to have a worship service here amidst the candles to remember the light that comes in the darkness and the darkness cannot overcome it. Also, you have been reading about our five-year plan. It has been completed. We had one session this morning during the Sunday school hour. We'll have another one next week also at the Sunday school hour and one this week on Wednesday night at six o'clock for us to know more about the plan the Lord has placed before us setting the course for this church. Many other opportunities that you see, but I want to especially thank you and encourage you um, to take a little trip after the worship service into the Family Life Center and you'll see Santa Claus has already been here in the form of the elves of First Presbyterian Church. You have taken names from the angel tree, you have seen the needs in our community, you have packaged those and brought them here. Some rode them into the great hall on the bicycles that some lucky child is going to get. Thank you. I, I was going to say it brings me great joy to see you coming with these gifts, but then I see your faces and see you have much more joy for the giving uh, than anyone else. So thank you for those amazing gifts. And speaking of gifts, our precious gifts, our children are invited to come now for a children's time with Reverend Luann. Good morning. Today I have brought a special stuffed animal along with me. Now this stuffed animal, this is a sheep, belongs to our family and you know what? It's seen a lot of happy times, but it's also seen some sad times. But I want to pass this sheep around to you. You can hold it just for a moment, but please hold her gently, okay? You know, if something happened to her, I think our family would be really sad. Um, in the book of John, Jesus talks about us being his precious sheep. He says that we're like his precious sheep. And he says that Jesus himself is like the shepherd, the good shepherd that takes care of the sheep. Have any of you seen sheep before close up? Yeah? Yeah in the mountains and you know they like to they're really afraid aren't they and they stay together and if something makes a sound all of a sudden they'll run away they're afraid of it but there's one person often that they will really trust and that's their shepherd who's looking out for them right because their shepherd brings them food and water their shepherd makes sure that no wolves or anything will harm them and they're also the shepherd, you know, it even stays awake sometimes at night while they're sleeping to make sure that nothing happens. In the book of Psalms, the psalmist talks about God never going to sleep, but that God will always be with us. In the 121st Psalm, it says, the Lord will not let you be hurt. The Lord who guards you never sleeps. Think about that. God watches over us all the time. Let's think a minute about some things that might be scary to us. Are thunderstorms scary? No. They can be in my family. Sometimes we all jump in the bed. Let's think about, just pretend for a moment, we're in the middle of the night and you've been woken up. What sound does thunder make? Let's make it with our feet. Ready? Right? And then rain comes. Can you help me make some rain? Stop. Now we can't do lightning, sorry, can't do that. But if you've been woken up in the middle of the night from thunder and lightning, is it easy to go back to sleep? No, because, no. because, because one time a thunder was coming, I slept all night and then I slept all day. Right, He's, you, sometimes you stay up all night because you're so afraid, right? But you know what, God says, I am with you even in the thunderstorms. I want to ask you a question. Have you ever, raise your hand if you've ever felt alone. Have you ever felt alone before? 
Maybe it was because you got lost, could that be? Or maybe it's because your friends left you out. Can you tell me about a time when you felt alone or afraid? Anybody want to tell me? Yes? I got lost in Bryant-Denny Stadium. In Bryant-Denny Stadium, he got lost, okay. <laughs> but did your parents find you eventually? I think they called him on the big thing. Over the loudspeaker, okay. Yeah. What? <laughs> Yeah, that's easy to get lost there. What about other times? Are there other times that you felt afraid or lost? Yes? Um, when I was in the store one time, I got lost. In the store, that's another scary place. I always tell my daughter she always has to see me, right? That can be scary, yes. In a storm. You, in a storm, you felt scary. So what is it that we're going to remember, right? We're going to remember the Lord will not let us be hurt, right? And the Lord who guards us never sleeps. Jesus will always know what's happening with us. Let us pray. Dear God, thank you for watching over us always, even as we sleep. We're grateful that you'll never leave us alone and that you'll keep us safe. In Christ's name we pray, amen. As the children go to be with Miss Debbie, I invite you to turn to your folks sitting around you and extend the right hand of Christian Mommy, I, fellowship. I feel Let us pray. Holy One, through your Holy Spirit, illumine our hearts that we may hear your call to become your path in the world. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. The Old Testament reading today comes from Isaiah chapter 40, verses 1 through 11, and can be found on page 667 of your Pew Bible. The Israelites have been exiled to another land wondering if they'll ever return home again. Listen to Isaiah's words of hope to them. Comfort, O oh comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that she has served her term and that her penalty is paid, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice cries out, in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up. Every mountain and hill be made low. The uneven ground shall become level, and the rough places a plain. Then the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all people shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. A voice says, cry out. And I said, what shall I cry? All people are grass, their consistency like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades. When the breath of the Lord blows upon it, surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Get you up to a high mountain, O Zion, herald of good tidings. Lift up your voice with strength. O Jerusalem, herald of good tidings, lift it up, do not fear. Say to the cities of Judah, here is your God. See, the Lord God comes with might, and his arm rules for him. His reward is with him, and his recompense before him. He will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms and carry them in his bosom. 
and gently lead the mother sheep. This ends the first reading. The one who is born, the Christ child, would also speak to his disciples in the 10th chapter of John, words that echo the prophecy fulfilled in his presence. The 10th chapter, beginning at verse 1. Very truly, I tell you, anyone who does not enter the sheep gate, sheepfold by the gate, but climbs in by another way is a thief and a bandit. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep hear his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes ahead of them, and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. They will not follow a stranger, but they will run from him because they do not know the voice of the strangers. Jesus used this figure of speech with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So again, Jesus said to them, Very truly, I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who come before me are thieves and bandits, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters by me will be saved and will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I come that they may have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand who, does not, who is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep 
sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and runs away, and the wolf snatches them and scatters them. The hired hand runs away because a hired hand does not care for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me just as the Father knows me and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep who are, that do not belong to this fold. I must bring them in also and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock one shepherd. For this reason, the Father loves me because I lay down my life in order to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have the power to lay it down. I have the power to take it up again. I have received this command from my Father. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Do you ever hear voices? You know, voices. Don't answer that one aloud. But you may have seen that marvelous movie a few years ago, A Brilliant Mind, in which as viewers we are caught up in the life of a brilliant mathematician. And like him, we can't tell what is real and what is not real, which voice is true and which is not. George Frederick Handel was a brilliant musician, born in Germany, but spent most of his life in England producing great operas that brought him such fame and renown. But as the opera began to lose its appeal, he turned to the oratorio, which in simple expression is opera light. It's opera without all the costumes. And he composed such oratorios as Saul, Judas Maccabeus, Solomon, and Samson. But none of these compare to Messiah. Many pieces we will be hearing during this Advent season, including already two this morning. The entire work talk took Handel 24 days to complete with all the orchestration. In fact, the Advent portion that we are hearing in these weeks, he composed in six days. Handel had help and he needed it. For you see, his fortunes had changed abruptly. No longer did the people flock to the opera. His income went down, he became bankrupt and lived in abject poverty. Then he had a cerebral hemorrhage that left the right side of his body paralyzed. He could not write a single note of music. His doctors prescribed a spa and he went and put himself in the boiling waters for sometimes nine hours at a time. And gradually he began to get movement back in his body and he was soon able to write music, but there was no music to write. He came home stumbling one night late at night and crying out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And he found the door of his house opened and inside was a strange man by the name of Charles Jennings, who is a wealthy countryman who brought with him a sheet of texts, passages from scripture and asked Handel, paid Handel, to write an oratorio based on those passages, two of which we have read this morning. The starting place for the work, Messiah, is indeed the prophecy of Isaiah. You remember their story, it's, it's our story too. The great days of Solomon and King David were long since past and the people had been warned by the prophets about their unfaithfulness and still they persisted and the Assyrians ran them over and took their able-bodied men, women and children back to Assyria, modern day Babylon. And the temple in Jerusalem was completely destroyed. The city lay in waste and they lived in exile for 40 long years. Now some of the older Israelites remembered the temple, remembered their struggle and their sad stories of punishment for their sins. The younger ones though had been born in captivity and really knew nothing except 
the mournful songs that they were taught by their families. We find them in the book of Lamentations, and they remind us of the songs that the people sang in Egypt, such as, how can we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? Perhaps you know what it's like to be in exile. It may be imposed by others, or sometimes it's self-imposed exile. You find yourself alienated from certain family members, bullied at school, you're rejected by friends, you are shunned at work, perhaps ostracized by the community. You may even find yourself at a distance from your church. Isaiah, who had earlier prophesied that Israel was on this collision course with the will of God and had warned them of the dire consequences they would suffer for their sins, now is wooing the people back out of captivity with words of hope. Comfort, comfort my people. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem. Cry to her that her warfare is over. She has received double from the Lord's hand for all of her sins. The Hebrew words are soft and they're resonant, almost in a form of a lullaby. Nahuma, Nahuma Ami, much like the beautiful pastoral sound of he shall lead his flock like a shepherd. It's like a parent who finds a child sobbing, knowing they have done wrong, takes the child up in the arms, hugs them and says, come on, it's time to go home. Lord knows exiles today need to hear the same voice. We parents sometimes feel like we failed our children. Teens are floundering with friendships that only seem to manipulate or pressure. Older adults find themselves in a world that's foreign to them because values have changed so much and it's a world that values only the young. Perhaps it's as students, we find ourselves in the wilderness, wondering what will become of our lives. And all of us have more than our share of regrets of what we have done or what we have left undone. On this Sunday, we have lit, lighted the candle of peace. And in some ways, it's, it's an empty candle because there's not a whole lot of peace in our lives. We feel strained by the pressures of exams coming on. We feel our family demands and pressures. We feel social pressures to conform. The finances are tighter maybe now than they've ever been in our lives, making us all captives in a time when there should be this peace in our lives. The comfort the comfort is pardon for sin. Separation from God, broken promises, rebellion, pardon for sin and a peace that endures the great hymns sing of God's great faithfulness. And here it finds voice again, the voice of Isaiah, the voice that Handel put it to music about God's coming, God's advent in Christ, a child born is for the forgiveness of sins, for the reconciling of the world into the peace that God alone can give, a peace that passes all understanding. Do you hear voices? A second voice in Isaiah cries out, in the wilderness prepare the way of the Lord. This week I got to see the marvelous production down at Shelton of Godspell. In this version, it begins with students sitting around their desks, and one is Plato, another is Descartes, another is Jean-Paul Sartre, all the different viewpoints and uh, demands put on our, us about what is real, what is true, what is not true. And in the midst of that, coming from the back, down the aisle, comes John the Baptist singing, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, prepare ye the way of the Lord. That's the voice that comes to us, to the exiled, and it's good news. It's just the news we need to hear. 
It's the news that says, prepare the way of the Lord. He's coming and he's going to take you home. But how do we get there? How do we get to that home? Some were old enough to remember how difficult the journey was to Babylon, the Trail of Tears, the thought of turning around now at their older age and going back to a devastation was almost beyond their comprehension. And remember, these were city folks now. They were in the center of civilization in Babylon. They had a place, they were surrounded by culture, and they were asked to go back to the sticks. And how do you get there without a guide? How do you get there without a map through the wilderness? How do you get there without a GPS? Remember, this exile was very different from Egypt. There in Babylon, they had made those homes and that living. In Egypt, they had a Moses to deliver them and go before them. Now they were told just to pack up and go home and that the way would be prepared. If you traveled over Thanksgiving or you're preparing to travel during Christmas, you know what it's like. None of the roads are ever prepared right. And you go past those same places that have been there for years, all the construction and destruction. You see one with a shovel and four standing, leaning on theirs. And you wonder why things never get fixed. You know what it's like. Highway construction is hard. And especially if you've ever been to Jerusalem and down to Jericho, you know that there is a 5,000 foot drop from Jerusalem to Jericho and a very few miles in between, steep, treacherous. Even with the super highway today, buses go up and down, back and forth. It's torturous driving even to this day. Think of what it was like in Babylon when you heard this invitation to come home and that the rough places would be made straight? Oh, come on. And yet, and yet, that is what happened, isn't it? The way was made for Mary and Joseph to come to Bethlehem, for shepherds to come from the field, from the wise ones to come from afar, the whole world coming to this place where a little child will lead them. Why? because the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. The third voice picks up the theme as well. The grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of our God will stand forever. We, the hearers of these voices of scripture, set to song by Handel, cry out. What shall we cry? The answer is right there in Isaiah. Get up to a high mountain. O Zion, O Jerusalem, O Tuscaloosa, get up to this mountain. Let your voice proclaim. Lift your voice. Do not be afraid. Say to the cities, here is your God. Two images are used. First, that of a king coming in procession, but the other of this shepherd coming, gently carrying the lamb in his bosom and leading the mother sheep, the church. So Jesus who comes, stands before us, declaring himself to be that good shepherd who knows the sheep by name, knows there are still some to be brought into the fold where he will call them by name. He leads them to safety and to salvation, and then he lays down his life for his sheep. This is the one who comes and who bids us to come home with him to his shelter, to his saving grace, to his peace that passes all understanding. So, we are called, you and I, to add our voice to the voice of Isaiah, the voice of Handel, the voice of disciples throughout the ages, to go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere, go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. Amen.
Having heard God's word proclaimed, I invite you now to stand as together we affirm what it is that we believe using our affirmation of faith from the declaration of faith. Friends, what do we believe? God did not forsake his people. God restored some of the people to their land and left others scattered over the earth. In a time of exile and alien rule, the Jews survived and multiplied. We testify that God is faithful. Even when we are faithless, God remains faithful. And uprooted peoples, riches of insight and daring visions that can judge and bless the world. We have confidence in God's coming kingdom, even in the darkest times. Please remain standing as we sing hymn number three, Comfort, Comfort, You My People. Because we have confidence in that voice that teaches us that God is our comforter, we hear now the prayer concerns of those who need that extra comfort. Wayne Childress continues recovering from his surgery at DCH. Baby Henry Orwell also continues uh, growing uh, at, but is still in the NICU at Northport DCH. Our prayers are with Bonabel Williamson and Kitty McIntyre who are in rehab at Northport DCH and for Vic Schomberger who is at Forest Manor Rehab. Our prayers are with those recovering at home, Sigel Friedman and John Drake we think of especially. And the prayers and sympathy of the congregation are with 
the family of Owen McDonald and especially his wife Angela. Upon Owen's death this past Thursday, the graveside was held yesterday at Memory Hills Gardens. And the prayers and sympathy of the congregation are with Patton and Cameron Kazire upon the death of their grandmother, Moselle Patton, on Saturday morning. There's no word yet of, in, of arrangements. Let us turn to God in prayer. God, our great comforter, we give thanks for the good news expressed in the prophetic, in the prophet's voice in the coming of our Lord. Yet, as we look around our world, we see a lack of that hope, a lack of your peace. We pray especially for countries who are experiencing great poverty, countries who are experiencing leadership that is not willing to share with all, countries that are experiencing war, as we look around our community, O oh Lord, we see a lack of your hope, a lack of peace. Lord, we pray for our church as it faces many decisions. Lord, we pray for those who have lost a sense of hope, who have forgotten what it means to trust. We pray for those who have experienced defeat, humiliation before their peers, those who've experienced great loss, whether through friendship or the death of family members or loss of health and family income. Lord, in this Advent time, we turn to you for hope, for that baby that we know that is coming to spread, who will spread good news. We look with comfort and we hold on to the words, words that even your son prayed with us. And we pray now together, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let us now share a portion of our life and labor with the Lord.
Let us pray. Lord, it is true. Nothing separates us from you, not sickness, not death, not exile, not loneliness, not despair, not one thing. When we start to roam, you chase after us. When we stray, you call us home. When the world weighs us down, you comfort us. So as the way is prepared before us, as the path is made clear to Bethlehem, we make our pilgrimages giving thanks for all you have done and continue to do for us. We dedicate our lives and our offerings to make it abundantly clear where our home is with you in your holy kingdom where we proclaim from the mountaintops that Jesus Christ is Lord. Amen. Please remain standing as we sing hymn number 29, Go Tell It on the Mountain.